Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, and I hope you do enjoy the day. We've got a very busy program, uh, which reflects a lot of things that we've been talking about in the last two days. Just to give you an overview and a flavor of the type of research that's going on now in ME. And I think, uh, like myself, you should be impressed by the quality and the breadth of research that is now under being undertaken in, in ME. So it's my role just to keep everybody on track and on time um, so we don't overrun the brakes. There is a parallel session being run here by the Young Emerge, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation. But hopefully the breaks are all coinciding so you can meet and interact with the younger researchers, who after all are probably the future of any research anyway. So we've got two meetings running in parallel. Okay, so again, welcome. And I'm just going to, um, so the today's is to summarize the things we talked about the last two days, as I've said. I just want to re-emphasize that we've lost and acknowledge the people that we've lost very recently. There was a slide up earlier, but I'd just like to repeat this again. So we've lost some very major players in the ME research field. Ian Gibson, I'm sure most of you remember. He was a real driver and instigator of ME conferences, a close friend, because he used to be based at UEA. Uh, Jonathan Kerr, a colleague of mine that works in the hospital in Norwich, uh, died very suddenly um, the earlier this year. It'll be a significant loss. And then we've lost some colleagues internationally. Uh, Mary Ann Fletcher uh, was a major player in developing uh, ME research in the US, and Ron Tompkins as well from Harvard, and then Jonas uh, Blomberg, who was one of the founding members of Emerge and played a major role in developing virus-based studies in ME. So we've lost some really important people. So ME research at the Quadrum Institute in Norwich. So our mission is to uncover disease mechanisms that would allow us to provide the evidence that would underpin interventions and hopefully be able to cure ME. And so our fundamental research is focused around viruses, uh, autoimmunity, and immune senescence, which is the aging of the immune system. And our translational research, which is focused around clinical trials, is um, based on photobiomodulation and microbiota replacement therapy, or FMT. Those are the things that are, we're currently working on. In addition, we're working with international colleagues, and it's one of the slides earlier mentioned Emerge, the European ME Research Group, so we're part of that, and also we've now developed Young Emerge to bring on the next generation of researchers in ME. And then our advocacy, so we're trying to get more money for ME research in the UK by influencing the policymakers, the people in government that make decisions. I'll just talk very briefly at the end about how we're going about that. And we're also trying to influence the funds as well to, to try and get more research into ME. So this is uh, the Norwich Research Park. There's five research institutions. In all, it's about 3,000 scientists that are spread across the university the Sainsbury Laboratory and the Earlham Institute, and then the Quadrum Institute here, which is a relatively new building. We've only been in it for about two and a half years. And then we've got a biorepository here, which allows us to establish biobanks of material tissues and samples. And then we have one of the largest hospitals in the region, uh, the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital, which has got about 1,200 acute beds. So it's a lot of activity based in really what's an area of about one kilometer. So, what are we looking at when we talk about ME? So, I think we can all appreciate this is a very complex disease. It affects multiple systems in the body. And trying to unravel this to identify what the underlying cause and triggers of the disease are is proving to be very difficult. So, I think we've probably got to take a more holistic approach when we look at ME to try and figure out how all these things may be interacting to try and then get to the origin of what really uh, initiates this. And, a couple of th and we're getting important clues now from SARS-CoV-2 epidemic, because I'm sure most of you know there's a significant portion of patients that develop long COVID are probably going to develop ME. The symptoms are really overlapping. So it's complex, and a lot of it focuses around dysregulation of the immune system that links into other um, disorders, and maybe it's related to virus infections. 
but ultimately this is sort of the, the postulate that we're looking at, that it's, a, it's an accelerated aging of the immune system, which is driven by the response to a chronic infection or reactivation of a latent infection. And so one of the sources that we think these microbes may come from or originate from, not the sole source, but one of the sources, are the microbes that inhabit our bodies, the microbiome, and particularly those that reside in the gut. And this is just my sort of, this is the microbiome in a slide, and I think it has a couple of important points. So we are probably more microbe than we are human. There are more microbial cells on and inside our body than we have cells of our own. And in terms of the coding capacity, the number of genes, our genome represents about 1% of the genes that from the DNA that we carry around with us every day. So there's always this philosophical question, are we more microbe than man? Um, they are very important to us. It's important we have these gut microbes. They play important roles in processing our food, digestion, particularly the plant constituents of our diet. They're not only bacteria. I know most of us think of it as bacteria only, but there are an equal number, if not more, viruses in this microbiome, as well as fungi and some eukaryotic cells as well, and archaea, which are ancient bacteria. So it's not just bacteria, but they all work together to process our food. They're important in maintaining immune fitness. It keeps our immune system functional, active, and efficient. And that's obviously important for our protection against infection. They are also a source of lots of nutrients, so vitamins, vitamin B12, for example. Most of that is derived from our gut microbes. Other important amino acids also derived from them. And they're very clever organisms. So bacteria can actually make hormones or mimics of our own hormones and neurotransmitters. So about 90% of the serotonin in our body comes from the gut and about 50% of the dopamine derives from the gut. So the gut is an important source of neurotransmitters and hormones. And our microbes can either make these directly or can influence when, how much, and when they're produced in the body. And we now know that they're important mediators of interaction between the gut and the brain. They can influence that information that passes from the gut to the brain and brain, uh, brain to the gut. And the outcomes of this are that it influences our mood, depression, anxiety, behavior. And it can also in influence our appetite, when we eat, how much we eat, before we feel full. And interesting now, we know that disturbances in our gut microbiome, that structural change or functional change, are linked to virtually every human disease, including ME. So there's an increased interest in looking at the microbiome and figuring out, is it a cause of these diseases or is it just an effect of the disease? And that's an important question. So our own research, we focus on severely affected patients, um, and that's principally because we think they may have the most obvious phenotype of the disease, so we may be able to identify uh, clear indicators of the disease in the most severe patients. Uh, and they are really a neglected part of the research portfolio when we look at ME research. So they make up a significant proportion of ME patients, maybe as many as 25% of all ME patients, yet less than 1% are included in research studies based on literature surveys. And one of the reasons for that is well, there are significant issues with a severe patient being able to contribute to research. They're often housebound or bedbound, so it's incredibly difficult for them to participate. And their symptom burden is very great, yet the severe patients we've all interacted with are incredibly enthusiastic about wanting to be involved in research. So I think we can overcome the logistical issues. You know, we have willing participants in research, and we should try and encourage their participation whenever we get the opportunity. So. Just a very brief snapshot of the sort of research we're doing. So I said we're interested in viruses. There are two, generally two types of viruses. There are those that infect our body. Some of these you will be very familiar with, herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr virus. So they infect the cells of our body. But then in our gut, we have a lot of uh, viruses, what we call bacteriophages or phages, that infect the bacteria. And they can integrate their own genes into the bacterial genome to change the behavior of that bacteria. Or they can invade it and kill the bacteria. So you can see that viruses can manipulate the bacterial population. They can change them through the way they behave. So we've been focusing on both of these. 
This study, we're just about finished. We've just submitted it for publication, and this has been carried out by a PhD student in my lab called Ernie, who's presenting his work next door. And so viruses are interesting because they're very common. They're more common than we think they are, particularly looking in the gut. You know, there are vast numbers of these, and we shed large amounts of these viruses every day. Uh, they're good at hiding, so most times they will lay dormant within our own cells or within the bacteria in the gut. But in response to certain types of stresses, they will reactivate, they'll kill the cell, and they'll go off and multiply and infect other cells. So they get reactivated under stress, and they interact with lots of sensory systems in the body, particularly the immune system. So they can manipulate, uh, destroy, um, hide behind the immune system. They're very effective at interacting with the immune system, but also the hormonal system as well as the uh, nervous system as well. And interestingly, they can activate as well as suppress immune response depending on the type of virus. So what we've uncovered in terms of looking at the virus in the gut is that we've undertaken one of the most comprehensive analysis of viruses. So we've not just looked at the viruses that are free uh, within the gut lumen. We're also looking at those that have infected bacteria to get a more complete picture of the viruses. We've identified changes in virus population with age, so different ME patients, different ages have different populations, so there's an age um, correlation. And we've identified clusters of viruses that seem to be specific for patients, and these, will be, these are the severe patients. And then we've looked at, well, what are these viruses able to interact? Which bacteria do they infect, and can they change or kill? So we've, identi we've been looking at these interactions, virus, bacteria, predator, host. And again, we're picking up some interesting differences in, in the healthy controls, which we always use the carer or the parent, so they live in the same environment, so they're exposed to the same things as the patient is, which is important for microbiome studies. And each of these groups have their own unique clusters. And what we're thinking is that these viruses that are in ME patients may be responsible or contribute to the change in bacterial populations that have been described recently in ME patients. So we're taking a step further back to try and identify what's driving change in bacterial populations that we're describing in ME. And this is the manuscript that's uh, currently under review from Ernie. So the other side of the story is, okay, so what about the immune system? How, how does the immune, immune system interact with our gut microbes? Is there evidence of an autoimmune type reactivity to this? And this is a project that Catherine uh, Seaton undertook as one of the invested ME PhD students. And this is basically the, the design of her study. So we take stool samples from our severe patients or the parent carers. We'd also take a blood sample. And from the blood sample, we take the serum which has the antibodies. And we'd be looking at whether or not the antibodies in, in the patient react with microbes in their own stool. So that's self reactive, if you like. And whether or not they can react with a foreign sample. So how, what's the extent of this reactivity to foreign microbes in the control? So a lot of analysis has been done, and two key findings. One is that severe ME patients actually have lower levels of antibody to, to foreign microbes. So they seem to be a little bit immunosufficient. And we think that might be important because it leaves gaps in the defenses, potentially for ME patients to become infected. And so maybe this might be related to more frequent infections that occur in ME patients. And then we've identified specific antibody interactions with particular types of microbes in ME patients, which is also interesting from the perspective of potential autoimmunity. So are these antibodies that react with specific gut bacteria, does this cause what we might say an autoimmune-like disorder in the patients? So that's the implication of our findings so far, and we're following up on some of these. And the paper is currently free access. It's on medical bioenterprise. So it's a preprint service. It's also under consideration publications. So these studies have been five years in the making. Um, so it's been a lot of work. We've had to develop a lot of protocols from scratch. But we now think we're sort of getting over the technology issues and obstacles. And now we can start to utilize this technology and expertise from these individuals, because Catherine is now the research fellow in the group, so she's now developing further research in Norwich. And so, 
One implication of this is, okay, if we can demonstrate disturbances in the immune system reacting with gut microbes and gut microbes are altered, can we reverse this or treat this uh, using gut microbe targeted therapies? And so this then brings us into the clinical trials that we're currently working on. And there's an increasing interest in manipulating gut microbes for the benefit of a variety of diseases. Because remember I told you there are change in microbes in the gut associated with most human diseases. So this potentially is a sort of gold mine of therapeutics if you can identify active microbes or active ingredients produced by microbes. There could be lots of potential therapeutic benefits to using them. So this is a study that we did, uh, published a while ago, but it illustrates the impact of FMT on some aspects of aging, and this is in mice, but I think it relates to ME. So if I can play this. So that's one of the first indications of actual causality of microbes in the gut impacting on the aging of various organ systems. The impact on the eye was completely novel to us, so we're now investigating that further. But I think it demonstrates that microbes can change how certain organ systems age. So in terms of what relevance this approach may have for FMT, uh, for, sorry, for ME, so this comes from the most positive indication comes from this individual here. Thomas Barodi in Sydney, who's been using FMT to treat a variety of conditions, and in particular ME, and reported on a study in which he undertook FMT in around 60 individuals, mild to severe ME. Um, 42 responded, improved sleep deprivation, fatigue, and lethargy. His treatment was not a complete FMT, so he picked particular microbes, and these were delivered by colonic in and rectal infusion. Importantly, 58% were symptom-free after 15 to 20 years. Um, and, and there was a resolution of GI symptoms in, in the vast majority of, of individuals. Clearly, quite interesting results, but they need to be substantiated in a clinical trial. More recently, uh, a retrospective study has been carried out of FMT in uh, a small group of ME patients. And sort of take our message from that, is it safe and promising, but it needs proper randomized clinical trials in order to evaluate it fully. It may not be the answer. It may be the answer for some patients, maybe not all patients, or maybe it's not going to work at all. But the only way we can get to that answer is to do carefully controlled clinical trials. And that's really what we've been working towards. So first we've been working with a Norwegian group on the comeback study which is an FMT trial in ME patients. The study's about to end, so we should get the data from the study uh, within the next few months. And basically involved 80 ME patients. They were given um, an FMT via an enema, and then they were followed up for 12 months using uh, fatigue scales and, and questionnaires to assess the impact. We've been working on the microbiome and the virome. So one of my PhD students here, Rick, 
has been visiting um, the Nordic University, collecting samples, processing them, bringing them back for sequencing analysis. And Rick is also working with a group at Annabrook's Hospital, just down the road, to work on a, a large multiplex screen to identify pathogens, other pathogens that may be in the gut of uh, ME patients. So Rick is now just sending all his samples off for sequencing, so we should have a viral analysis within the next couple of months. And that's a demonstration of how we can work together, collectively across Europe, to advance any research. And it's led by Peter Janssen and Rasmus Gould and Lynn Given. And then close to home in Norwich, we, some of you may be, know, been working on the Restore Me and have been wondering, when is this going to happen? Is it ever going to happen? Uh, it is going to happen. We suffered some setbacks with COVID and government regulatory bodies, which I'll illustrate in the next slide. But this will be a randomized control phase 2B trial. Um, 120 patients. This may be able to be increased. Uh, we're just looking at that again now. Uh, we're delivering the FMT via capsules. So we've moved away from tube delivery to capsule delivery. And we're assessing them over six months. And this study, we're trying to build in objective outcome measures. So measures that we can actually quantify accurately rather than based on more subjective uh, questionnaire type responses. We've received additional funding, some from other ME charities, to help us expand the scope of the work. So with ME Research UK, we've got additional funds to do analysis of the eukaryotic virome. So we'll be looking in the blood and some tissues of these patients pre and post treatment. What impact is having on those viruses that hide within cells in our body? And also be looking at the viruses and whether or not they can impact on the host immune system. And that's a project that Catherine got funding from Solvany, the big American uh, charity. And that's to look at immunosenescence. So if we can identify viruses that are associated with ME, are those the viruses that drive immune senescence? And can, F, can uh, FMT or MRT restore the function of the immune system in patients? So there's excitement building around this. And this is sort of some, uh, an overview of the study design. It involves a lot of specialists. And fortunate being in Norwich Research Park, we've got a lot of them very locally. So gastroenterologists, clinical trial specialists, aging and dementia research is a big thing in Norwich, so we can build on that. Human governance, ophthalmology, immunology, sleep science, virology. So a lot of people coming together to help us design the study and get the most out of the studies we can. So these are the capsules. We call them Neptune capsules. Any idea why we call them Neptune capsules? Astronomers here? It's next to Uranus. <laughs> that was Thomas Barodi's, not mine. Okay. So Neptune, so I said, okay, Thomas, I'll call them Neptune capsules. Um, now he's fully on board, of course. So the, the purpose of the trial is to test, evaluate capsule delivery, because that's one of the important things. Are any patient able to take the capsules, particularly the severe patients? Because now with capsules, patients don't have to come to us. We can deliver the treatment to them. So it's an important to get, again, the severe patients involved. And it's the first, as, uh, first trial to a test efficacy in FMT. It may or may not work, but at least we'll know that from the trial. And we're putting objective outcome measures in as well. So we're measuring physical activity using accelerometers. We're measuring sleep with an accurate sleep questionnaire developed by University of Helsinki, uh, University of Oslo in Helsinki. Physical capacity, we're working with Christian Sommerfeld, who's in the audience here from Norway, on a means of assessing physical capacity. So it's not active, it's capacity. And then vision and cognitive function, we're using a, a battery of tests developed in the Dementia Research Unit at Norwich called Neuron to accurately assess cognitive function. And so this is the timeline. This could have been ramped back a couple of years ago to when we thought we'd be able to start. However, COVID uh, threw a spanner in the works. And then the regulatory body that governs medicines and clinical trials, the MHRA, in their infinite wisdom, decided that human still was a medicine and therefore has to be prepared, handled, and treated in the same way they would manufacture a drug, which meant we had to go back and retrofit our facilities so it was now super clean and met GMP conditions. So we had to go away and obtain more funding 
to enable us to do that. It's about a half a million pounds to retrograde fit our facility. The building work is ongoing and we hope that it will be completed in later this month, in June. We then have to wait for the inspectorate, the MHRA, who are now only switching back to their day jobs from all COVID-related activities. So we've got to wait until we can get them to inspect. And then we get the license, and then we can apply for the license for the trial. So it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of people involved, but we're hoping that we'll have a lot of this done by the beginning of the fall, uh, the autumn, and that we're ready to start recruiting in December. And recruitment is through the East Coast Community Healthcare. So one of the things that's happened since we've had to stall on this process is patients have been calling up and asking to be involved in the trial. And when I spoke to them last week, they have 300 people on the waiting list. So thanks to all of you that have volunteered for the trial, we will start to be assessing those people on the list for inclusion in the trial. So we're hoping this is the last time I'm able to show this slide, and the next time I'm here, we can tell you the results. A new trial that we started is uh, photobiomodulation. So this is low light therapy, and this is called the Light Me Up study. And it, this has been around for a very long time, and it's an effective treatment for a variety of conditions, pain, inflammation, inflammation, edema, wound, regeneration of bones and tendons. The FDA in America approves it for certain applications, acne, muscle, joint pain, arthritis, blood, circulation issues, and I'm particularly interested in this hair loss. Maybe I'll uh, grow some hair back. But it's a promising application for cell-based therapies as well, and it's, it, the scope of its use is, is expanding all the time. And there's considerable interest in using it in chronic fatigue. And so why might we think this might be beneficial for ME? So ME patients have mitochondrial dysfunction. I should say that if you use light at a particular wavelength, you reboot mitochondria. You boost their ability to produce ATP, which is the important energy source for the body. So red light at a particular wavelength will trigger your my mitochondria to become more efficient in producing ATP. And of course, we all know there's mitochondrial dysfunction in ME patients high levels of oxidative stress and limited ATP production. And prior human studies in other unrelated diseases to ME have shown that ATP production is restored after exposure to these, uh, to these lights, these lamps. And so this is our hypothesis. We can expose patients to the lamp. We'll reboot, re-energize the mitochondria. I'm not quite sure we'll get bed-bound patients running marathons, but certainly that's an aspiration that we can hope for. So, but again, we don't, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to say this may or may not work, so we've got to design a proper trial in order to evaluate it. So we're just starting this process. And again, this involves a team. I'm not doing this on my own. It involves these individuals here. This is Christian, by the way, who's developed the FUNCAP, the Physical Capacity Assessment Tool. This is Professor Glenn Glibson at UCL, who's the LAMP I, retina expert, expert, he gave a presentation here yesterday. Michael Hornberger is the dementia studies person and Andy Atkins is the exercise physiology environmental scientist. So we're all coming together to design the study. Uh, Invest in ME will I'd help us identify patients that might be suitable for the phase one start, which will just involve a very small number of patients. You know, so can patients use the lamp? Are they okay in using the lamp? Can they use these objective measures? It's a means of assessing the suitability of this study design. If it's success, then we'll expand it, obviously, to more. And the eligibility is, is really we're trying to be inclusive, not exclusive. So a diagnosis living in the UK can be older than 18 years of age. And it's a remote study. So again, we're looking at inclusivity here and trying to get severely affected patients involved if we can. So we're using a system called Mantle, that's a remote management system, so patients will be mailed out the lamps, mailed out the accelerometers, and will be able to do all the online consent and recording of their uh, data, all using this remote system. And we're not and planning on doing any study visits. So again, it's remote, and we should get severe patients. And it's, it's mailing things to them, and then mailing them back. So we're trying to make this as simple as we can. And this study is being led by Catherine as well, who I introduced already. So this is now pending ethical review. We submitted all the ethical applications uh, about a week ago, so we're just waiting the outcome. 
as soon as we have those approvals, we'll be able to start the trial. We have the lamps, we have what we think is the protocol ready, so this could happen very quickly. So influencing polymakers, just to finish up. Uh, trying to get more box to do more research for ME. And we are part of, say, we, Richard and myself, we represent the UK uh, on the UK's new initiative to develop an MSC delivery plan. This is how do we, you know, if we were to get more money, what would we use it for? What would be the plan for progressing ME research? That's with the UK Government Department of Health and Social Care. And then Vicky Whitmore, who's the next speak, kindly invited Richard and myself to participate in an American version of that through the National Institutes of Health, which is an ME research roadmap, and Richard and I are part of the working group. So again, we're trying to work across borders to try and get a uniform approach to this. And in Quadrant, we're trying to get as many MPs and policymakers through the Institute as possible. Helen Waitley is the Minister of State for Social Care, to who will receive this report and then decide how government's going to act. So we're trying to go to the very top to make sure they're aware of what we're doing and what we need to do. And then we've got an appointment next week with Carol Monaghan, who's the chair of the All Parliamentary Group on ME. Um, and she's a Scottish MEP, I think. Um, so that we're meeting her next week. And then we have a rolling list of MPs that come through. And again, we try and persuade them to uh, make sure that ME is on the agenda when it comes to making decisions about research and ME. So those are the activities we're doing. Um, I said I'm part of Emerge, and it's an important organization. The flag to represent the members, I think it's a little bit dated now. But I co-chair this with Jesper Melson, who's in the audience as well, who's presenting later. And these are some of the things that Emerge is doing. Okay, We were trying to work together. We're trying to get involved with as many policy makers as we possibly can. They're involved in these trials that I've mentioned. We've got Emerge members of that. And of course, we organize this colloquium as well. So we, we think we play an important role. And then new this year is Young Emerge. And again, this is to try and encourage people to get involved in ME research, to continue our legacy, if you like. Uh, and the objectives are here as well. And as I said, they're running a, their own uh, colloquium across the way. And these are the important players in Young Emerge. So Catherine is currently the chair. And then Karen, Donya, and Rick are all part of this. So I encourage you to talk to them, interact with them, find out what they're doing. They're all incredibly enthusiastic, incredibly talented researchers. So we need to encourage them to keep going. And finally, we need you. So we are trying to develop an ME registry uh, at Quadram using our existing Institute Research Volunteer Database. So if you're on the database, you get informed about lots of interventions and trials, some of which are ME related, not all of them. Uh, and that's a good way of finding out what we're doing and what's coming up and how to get, get involved. So I encourage you to sign up and register now. And with that, I'll thank you very much. So if anybody has a quick question, if not, I'm here all day, and I'd be very happy to talk to people in the breaks, but if there's a burning question, to the right, Richard. Um, thank you for that presentation, it was great. Has anybody thought about the muscle? With most severe people, especially young girls, the muscles in their gut don't work properly. Um, and there's the calcium channels and magnesium. So does that impact your work? Yeah, so we're interested in micronutrients, um, and in particular the vitamins, but also things like metals. And these are all, influ all micro the microbes in your gut all inf influence that in terms of uptake, production. And we are working with a group at Queen Mary uh, using a, a sort of novel explant system where we're looking at muscle motility and what microbial products might stimulate that. And their interest is constipation. I'm just interested in knowing how microbes regulate physiology in the gut. So yes, we are looking at that. Very difficult to do those studies in humans, but they've developed this explant, which is a piece of tissue that comes from surgical samples, which we can then put our viruses, microbes, microbial products on to look at how it influences motility. 